What's a fatal mistake that you see way too often? I've seen many big name OEMs try to come through at the last minute and say, I want to launch my product in six weeks. And um, <laughs> that's great, but you realize you're basically in for a re-architecture of your whole design. <laughs> From EE Tech Media, this is Moore's Lobby, where engineers gather to talk all about circuits. I'm Dave Finch. Today we'll look at firmware proficiency and what that means for the hardware engineer. Embedded computing and control have become ubiquitous features in modern electronics. Nowadays, even the equipment that blends our margaritas at the entry level runs some version of firmware. And it's not surprising. The bomb costs introduced by fitting a circuit with embedded control capabilities are almost negligible when you consider the features and performance it affords you. In some cases, Adding compute capability actually enables an engineer to completely reimagine a system and substantially lower its overall production cost. Thinking back to the margaritas, an AC universal motor control circuit is achievable at minimal cost using a simple thigh wrister and some passive components. But what if we consider a sensorless DC chopper drive built on an inexpensive 8-bit microcontroller, a simple output stage, and some MOSFETs? The resultant gains in efficiency may enable you to reduce the physical size of your motor and the surface area necessary for proper thermal management, and with some clever engineering, maybe the PID controller can operate well enough without a Hall Effect sensor, which also helps to reduce system cost. You'll offer better performance and more options to the consumer. All it takes is a little firmware savvy. Of course, not every hardware engineer wants to be a programmer, which begs the question, do we even have the option of not being proficient in firmware and software development, at least to some degree? Today, we're visited by two engineers who have complementing perspectives on the convergence of hardware and software design and what that implies to the engineer. Sean Newton, Microcontroller Applications Manager at ST Microelectronics, shares today's landscape of novel embedded adoption. And there's a lot of new techniques coming out that help uh, smooth that digital control and actually give you an advantage over what we've had in analog control in the past. But first, Tim Sager is Executive Vice President and Chief Research and Development Officer at iRobot, the company redefining floor and lawn care. While I've been off in the weeds reimagining the perfect margarita blender, Tim has been working hard to create a world-class and scalable robotics platform for consumer vacuums, mops, lawnmowers, and <laughs> frankly, who knows what else. His engineer's mission? To deliver the best in hardware and, you guessed it, firmware. Tim, how many electronic design engineers are employed right now at iRobot? Uh, it's, I'd say probably in the 30s, something like that. Um, robotics, it's, it, you mentioned this, Dave, it's multidisciplinary um, but he's a big part of it. And this must be some team, because robotics combines so many different elements, whether it's positional awareness, sensing, motion control, autonomy, um, very sophisticated hardware challenges. And I would imagine that all of this requires uh, very carefully architected and designed firmware as well. That's, that's totally right. My background personally is EE in my, my, I'll call it my distant training. And I, I have an appreciation for the fact that the stuff that we're doing, because it's consumer, it has to be cost effective. But this is a super technical product, both because it's high speed digital, there's a bunch of analog in it, uh, RF, all of it is under software control, sort of at the different layers that we have. It's super interesting, but it's also super technically challenging. And what most people don't realize is because to them, it's, I'll say it's a vacuum cleaner. But there's so much intelligence embedded in this thing that's at every layer from the hardware all the way through the software. It's just super interesting technically. It really is. And especially the challenges you're trying to overcome. You need to make this simple enough for the user and foolproof. But inside the device, you're dealing with things like motors turning on and off. You're dealing with RF. You're dealing with uh, power supplies on the charging side of things. There's a lot of things that can go wrong when you're introducing that many variables, that much noise in such a compact little form factor. Oh, for sure. And there's all the compliance stuff that has to happen, mm -hmm. the power efficiency, all the different yep. things. It's just challenging. So 
The team that we have is it's actually quite skilled because all the things that you described, it has to show up in a way that just works. You know, this is what you need for consumer product. It just has to work right. and be easy to use. And all that stuff has just really strong technology and architecture and design practices underneath it. Of your engineers, what percentage uh, would you say have significant experience with firmware development? The, the organization's really, uh, I'll say, strong on the, it's a strong technical organization anyway, I, I would say, because of the, the disciplines and the work that we do. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the organization is software at this point, I'll say broadly. In the EE team, I think there's a fair number of them that also, I'll, I'll call them, are software literate. In mm -hmm. the context of the work that we do, almost everything is under some form of software integration and control. There's some very uh, specialized practices that show up under software control higher up in the stack. But, you know, when you look at, we, we've got RF capability um, in the organization that uh, man manages all the design. We've got all the, the circuit design and layout work that happens typically internally for us. A lot of that shows up under software control eventually, but a lot of it shows up under firmware control and with integration because of the stuff that you described. You're controlling physical things. You're integrating sensors. You need to actually be able to have um, reliable communications and all that stuff happens through, through firmware typically. Yeah. I'm thinking about some of the hardware engineers I know who have, uh, who have become pretty strong coders over the years, um, whether it was out of necessity, personal aspiration, whatever. Now, there's the ability to understand and write firmware. And then there's being a highly specialized software developer. Do you find that your contributors are equally capable hardware and software developers, or are there, say, pockets of specialization throughout the team? There's, we, we actually have the, even for the firmware, I'll say we've got specialized teams in the software group because the production code is so complex that we felt like it was better overall, I'll say, from the quality of software point of view to have specialized software people that were uh, really responsible for the in, in software products, if you will. But there's a very tight coupling in with the hardware team, the double E team. And many of those engineers also have the ability to program, right? They, they can, it's just that that's not their discipline per se. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier for them, especially when you're thinking about prototyping or even just trying to debug a circuit, you really need to be able to work through the software and it, from our point of view, that's that's at least a really strong benefit for them, even if they're not uh, either asked or able from a functional discipline point of view to write production code. There's just so much in that architecturally, especially when you've got such a complex real-time environment that, that it's really the timing's important, the code architecture is important to make everything run correctly. And so we felt like it was best overall to have specialized software teams for that, just working very, very closely with the EE design teams. Absolutely. Um, and I, I liken it like if I were to take now the perspective of, say, the software engineer, certainly they are aware that the board needs to be laid out, you know, in a way that's very RF robust, but they wouldn't have the years or decades of experience that a PCB uh, layout design engineer uh, might have in saying, well, we know that these have to be one mil traces and here's how we're going right. to, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's it's similar. And, and quite honestly, one of the things that I think is actually a, a strong skill, and I value it a lot, actually, in some of the teams that are, are doing advanced development work, for example, you, you want people who are, you know, sort of switch hitters that can do a bit of both, uh, mm. especially when you're doing prototyping work, you're doing early stage, quick and dirty, you want to see if something works, you want to test out some kind of application. It's really just super helpful if you don't have to worry about the production elements of the software and sort of the hardness of it mm -hmm. to just have a person or a small team that can kind of go back and forth. And it's the same, like you were saying, Dave, if you don't have to worry about the, you know, the radiation characteristics of your circuit design, you can, you can have people that can kind of go back and forth and, you know, dabble in both and still figure out how to put something together and really check out what it's doing. That's really what they're trying to do at that stage. Mm -hmm. Yep. So as a VP of engineering and as a chief officer, what are some of the imperatives that are on your desk nowadays? You know, is your mind on investigating new technologies, honing various hardware and software architectures, or do you have to be looking at things at sort of a, at a higher elevation? Right. Yeah, that's a great question, Dave. So our products are, are, I'll just, our audience, I think your audience would, would I'm sure understand this. They're so high tech. The, the edge that we're trying to push as an organization, iRobot is a premium brand. And the value that we try to offer through our products, much of it is built on technology ultimately. Mm -hmm. And so 
we really feel like we've got to be, I'll say, near the leading edge of technology. And the, the physical platform, the electronics attached to it have to enable now what I think is, is actually world-class software. Mm -hmm. the, the robots that we're, we're shipping now have a vision-based navigation system. So we're using technology that often is, is heavily either linked to or we're riding the cell phone industry. Just the kinds of compute that we put into these products now is growing dramatically. And being able to do that quickly, leverage third party, whether it's open source software or leverage other industries componentry to try to get it in place quickly and then have it sort of integrated. The, the, real, the real value that I think we offer as a company, it has to be directed at a consumer problem, but we, it's really the integration. It's what robotics is, is you're integrating things and technology. We don't have to invent everything, but it has to come together and point in exactly the right way. Right. And so for us, Figuring out how to lead in technology and assemble this into a system that just works for people, all the way back to one of the things you were saying earlier, it just has to work. Nobody nobody needs to care that it's a vision-based navigation system or all the stuff <laughs> that it is underneath the hood. <laughs> right. But man, right. getting all that to work well together and doing it quickly and basically trying to out-engineer the rest of the world, you yeah. know, all the competitors that we have. Yeah, that's very much on my mind. Right. You know, very, very much on my mind. You know, and this is one of the challenges of working with um, this part of the industry is you really have to have a long technology horizon. It, it's also one of the reasons, quite honestly, that we're trying to use other industry applications where it's appropriate for us. So the cell phone industry is a natural one because of the, the progression of technology and, and cameras and optics in that class of products that compute in that as well too. And a lot of the technology in cell phones is, is actually applicable to the things that we do in robotics as well. See, now that's interesting to me, that crossover, um, or maybe convergence is the, the right word. How are you adapting, for example, cell phone technology uh, for your devices at iRobot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, it starts uh, with the, the chipset, the core computing engine in it. We also integrate um, a version of Linux as the core compute platform for mm -hmm. the product. And that actually opens up a quite a bit of, of technology that we can then integrate. Some of it is, I'll say, direct integration from the suppliers in software. It could be software components, um, but it also helps us choose, uh, you know, Wi-Fi radios and, and other sort of off-the-shelf commercial components that could come from the cell phone industry as well, too. Yeah. Right? So anywhere we can get access to that supply chain and either, either customize it or integrate it, it's just a real win for us because that also is super high volume. It's a way to, for us to gain leverage. Yep. I can totally see the point now that you were making earlier about, yeah, you need engineers who can think and design at the system level, you know, take all these different blocks, integrate them and make them work seamlessly. That's really the key. Oh, uh, totally. It's interesting. I, in my own background, I tend to think of myself as a systems oriented thinker. Sure. And I, I think it's one of the reasons I'm attracted to robotics because it, it literally is, you know, there's in some of our some of the elements of our product, you've got everything from the physical, you know, all the way down to charging systems and motor control, uh, other kinds of sensors to optics. You've got um, high-speed digital electronics, image processing, you know, every sort of type of firmware you could imagine. And then all the way up to sort of in the robot applications that control how it navigates in the home. Right. I mean, it really is a very complex and interesting system. Yeah. And so people, and, and one of the things I value on my team is people who can hold significant parts of that, I'll say in their head, and mm. they can understand how it all works. And those people can live in, in our hardware teams and our EE teams. They can live in uh, our systems engineering groups as well too. They can also, of course, live in our software teams. Uh, but it, it is just so valuable to be able to hold big chunks of that system in your head. And then you'll have an ability to help architect the robot in ways that are just really effective. Right. And um, architecture, of course, is a much different proposition than design. What makes for really well-designed firmware? Yeah, it's interesting. I think I, I, I'd start with the fact of uh, sort of the scale and the robustness it that we try to operate at. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're trying to do in the organization is, I'll just say, have a world-class software engineering team. And in our particular application, that's a little unusual because most companies, when they think of software or software engineering groups, usually it's pure software. And when you're trying to develop firmware, 
and you're trying to actually develop an, a real-time application that's running on a consumer-grade hardware, that's challenging. Yeah. And to have it be done in an effective software engineering-oriented way, yeah. that's not something that a lot of companies know how to do well, hmm. uh, as I've experienced and when, when I've talked to people in the industry. So what we're actually trying to do is import the best of what I'll call them pure software development practices and techniques, but apply them to I'll also say world-class hardware design because to get the pace that we need and the quality of the hardware architectures, it has to be integrated well with software engineering practices. Yeah. But most modern software companies are really just pure software. They're not doing the kind of system engineering that we're doing at iRobot. And that just creates a unique set of challenges, but it's part of what, you know, what makes it interesting from an engineering organization point of view. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Uh, so I want to diverge a little bit from the topic of firmware. Mm -hmm. I'm always fascinated by how people got to where they are, uh, because there are no repeatable career paths. Right? Yeah, I would agree. You were at Thompson when set-top box ruled the consumer space. Then you had a substantial leadership role at Bose Corporation, hands down the sweetheart brand of consumer audio. And now, um, in leading the engineering organization at iRobot, you're ultimately tasked with bringing world-class robotics to the consumer's hands for yet another industry leader. Now, um, some people can slip upwards through the cracks where they work, whether it's through friendships with the right people or simply blind spots uh, in the executive committee. It's called failing up, right? And it happens all the time. But mm -hmm. you really can't get away with that in a technical organization, right? Like engineering, I feel like, is a very honest, very pure proving ground. The same way that, say, a comedy club tests a comedian or a jazz club tests a musician, it works or it doesn't. No room for imposters. And I think your success at these top consumer electronics companies really speaks to your abilities as both an engineer, but also as a strategic business thinker. It's, it's really an interesting combination of talents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel really fortunate, honestly, Dave. iRobot is, it's a cool company. And I feel like that um, the technology is interesting, but I also feel like the company's interesting. The products, I think, have a, a fan base and a um, I'll say following, right? I mean, you, you see it on, in the media all the time. People talk about their Roombas and the products that, that we make. It's just, it's fun to watch. It really is. But I feel really fortunate to be a part of a company that's, that's like this, uh, working with the people that I get to work with. How you get through a career like this, I couldn't agree more. Some of it is just timing. Some of it is just, I'll say, being in the right place at the right time. You know, um, there is no real path to it. The thing that I you know, it's it's interesting uh, as I've thought about my career at different times. One of the things I think that's at least I feel like it's helped me is I've wanted to work at companies that cared about engineering, that it was an important part of who they were. And that's one of the things I, I value highly about iRobot. It was very present in Bose as well, too. As a premium branded company, iRobot tries to solve problems for people, but they're often doing it through technology. And so the technology we create and the way we deliver it through our products, whether it's in the software or the hardware, it's, it's essential to who we are. And I love being part of a company that values the work that way. And so, you know, being attached to a company like that, it's great. And then it gives you opportunities that, that maybe you wouldn't have at other companies too sometimes. Absolutely. If you're in technology, you tend to want to solve real problems. I mean, that that's the essence of technology, improving mm -hmm. our quality of life. And, and I think if you're not sure what problems you're trying to solve or why, uh, then you're really just floating in a current of sales and marketing whims, <laughs> right? Uh, what, I, what I've come to appreciate about really good engineering companies, um, iRobot, Bose, wherever, here are companies that build advanced electronic solutions that, that not only improve a person's day-to-day, -day, but make it substantially better. You know, single guy living with a couple Siberian Huskies, dog hair everywhere. You unbox a Roomba, hit go, and within a few minutes you realize, hey, my life was already pretty awesome. I didn't know it could be this awesome. <laughs> right. And uh, same thing with Bose, where it's like, mm -hmm. look, I knew things would sound better with a good home theater, but I didn't know that watching a Pixar movie with my kids could be this enjoyable. Um, it, it's got to be so much fun to take on these challenges on behalf of the consumer and then deliver groundbreaking products that, that they don't even know about yet. Totally. I, I was smiling listening to you describe 
the experiences and the, the products. It, it's one of the reasons why I like being at iRobot because it's such a relatable product for many people. And um, there's, I, when I first started my career, I worked in defense and there's lots of you know great opportunities and careers in defense. But one of the things I wanted was to be able to work in consumer so that I could talk to people about my work. And when I hear somebody light up about a Roomba story or about how they've experienced the product or what they think is great about it, it just, you can't not smile. I mean, it's, it's part of what gives me energy attached to the things that we do because they're hard, but at the same time, you get a chance to see somebody light up when they experience the product. Uh, it's really makes it all worthwhile. This episode of Moore's Lobby is sponsored by Samtech, a global supplier of connectors, cable assemblies, and design solutions. Products include high-speed, board-level interconnects capable of up to 112 gigabits per second performance, high-speed cable assemblies, mid-board optical systems, IC packaging, and microelectronics expertise, the industry's largest variety of board-to-board -board interconnects, rugged and power systems, micro-rugged interconnects, and sealed products. Samtech provides full channel system support, streamlining and optimizing the signal path from the IC to the board and beyond. Visit samtech.com to learn more. Although iRobot's engineering team comprises mostly software engineers, there are many mid and small cap engineering companies that simply don't have the resources to staff teams of developers. If you work at one of these companies and you don't have expertise in code design, what are your options? Sean Newton is a microcontroller applications manager at ST Microelectronics. His team supports thousands of customers, and he shares with us his perspective on how we engineers can build coding proficiency and why we should. Sean, welcome to the lobby. Um, what would you say are some recent application sectors that are adopting microcontrollers or, you know, Im embedded control at an, sort of an accelerated clip? Like 20 years ago, you would have said lighting and appliance controls, maybe even like certain power supply manufacturers uh, were introducing more and more embedded controls into their power supplies. Nowadays, are there still pockets of the industry that we're slow to adopt microcontroller usage, but are now finding that it's actually advantageous to bring in embedded control? Yes. You know, it's been around for 10, 15 years, but digital motor control has been around for some time. All sorts of different types of motors, uh, PSM, uh, permanent magnet synchronous motors, uh, FOC, field-oriented control. That type of application has driven um, a lot of new features in microcontrollers recently plus the integration of additional analog components such as comparators, op amps, and ADCs uh, necessary for uh, completing a whole system. In recent developments, I would say also that uh, we've seen great interest recently in digital controlled power supply. Hmm. Typically, the power supply markets have been uh, driven by analog controllers, dedicated analog controllers. Uh, but what we're finding now is that the Frequency of microcontrollers and the analog peripherals are such that we can now control digital power supplies at different levels as well. So if you're creating a uh, buck boost or a, a equivalent circuit, or if you need a, a PFC, a power factor correction front end, the microcontroller has the capability of uh, controlling that very well. And that gives you some additional advantages over the traditional analog controllers uh, not only can you develop new control algorithms, but you also have a wide range of parameters you can now uh, on the fly basically adjust for. Um, you still have your fixed hardware parameters, uh, your RLC type uh, constraints, your capacitance and your inductors mm -hmm. and all your designs uh, that you have to take in consideration. But you can definitely play around with things such as your, uh, your frequency, your PWM frequencies, for ideal uh, matching. And there's a lot of new techniques coming out that help uh, smooth that digital control and actually give you an advantage over what we've had in analog control in the past. See, that makes a lot of sense to me um, because really the essence of it is you're looking at the output, you're looking at the load demand, you're looking at what you know you can characterize what the supply is capable of for a given load demand. But now you can just... Um, respond, say, that much faster, maybe that much more accurately? That's correct. Uh, 
the speeds of microcontrollers, uh, you can get up to around 150 or higher megahertz on a microcontroller and generating um, uh, substantial calculation speeds. And we're finding that we can uh, look at the total uh, calculation times and they're well within what you need for traditional analog control, if not better. And you have the ability to adjust some of these parameters on the fly and optimize your, your control algorithms, uh, which is rather exciting. To add to that, there are several um, uh, engineering programs as well, software programs you can use and tools. You may have heard of uh, MATLAB and there's some other uh, power mm -hmm. control uh, tools that we have out there. Breach is another one that, that they have algorithm development tools that help you use microcontrollers to develop whatever algorithm you need to control your power, uh, your, your power output based on your application. What is the output, for example, if I'm using MATLAB to um, either design or even fine tune, is it executable? Is it source code? Typically, it's source code. In, in the embedded world, especially the, the one I live in with 32-bit uh, microcontrollers, mm -hmm. I would say 80-85% of the market's probably coding in C. Um, I don't know if you saw the results of the latest software poll, but I believe that C has become the number one uh, as far as uh, coding in the world again. The C language is still in everything we do. It's basically embedded, uh, if you look at it, m at microprocessors as well. Uh, it's embedded in low-level Windows. It's embedded in Linux. Uh, it's, it's embedded in a lot of different applications that have to use um, a higher-level language, but at the hardware level. It hasn't gone away. So mm -hmm. the algorithms are exported in basically C language with uh, .c files, .h files that you can take into your uh, embedded project and wrap that into what you need to control for your overall system. Uh, the Bericha tool, Bericha is a partner of, of ST Microelectronics and that Bericha tool uh, allows you to put all your parameters in. It'll help calculate your control algorithms, what you need to do. And it's a really powerful tool to get you started with microcontroller design. MATLAB has a similar uh, feature. Of course, MATLAB is used for more mathematic, mathematical simulation, uh, mm -hmm. but it allows you to develop your algorithms and export them in C and, and .h files. And then you could put them into your project and test them out. The secondary tool that we have for motor control that we've improved greatly over the years, our motor control workbench, it's a similar tool you would specify your motor characteristics, how many pull pairs you have, your um, power supply, what you need to drive that motor. And you can connect through your uh, power stage, your motor, and the tool will actually do a motor characterization for you and find your ideal tuning parameters based on some characterization algorithms it has to help initially set your control rhythm so that you know what you need to start your motor, start spinning your motor, what you need for velocity versus torque uh, control. So these tools have come a long way, especially in the digital realm, to uh, take advantage of the digital architecture and the flexibility you have to uh, build different motor control or power supply algorithms for your application. As more motor control and power supply applications are adopting microcontrollers, are we starting to see new integrations in terms of peripherals or macro cells that would enable these applications directly from the micro? More or less. I, I like to look at a microcontroller, uh, the way I look at it is that you have your CPU there, but the microcontroller is much more than the CPU. Uh, mm -hmm. It has advanced peripherals. And so if you're going to drive a motor, the first thing you need is a decent timer. Uh, you need to be able to have a timer that can output basically six complementary signals. Uh, basically, they're in three pairs uh, mm -hmm. for three-phase motor control. Uh, and then you need to have an ADC, at least. And then you may want to have other uh, circuitry for analog, such as comparators or op-amps for measuring certain uh, uh, characteristics. But the main thing with the microcontroller is what you may have called the macro cells. I would refer to that as linkage. Mm. Uh, we have very good tight linkage between the timers the, the uh, ADCs, the comparators, the op amps, and the CPU. And what that brings to the table is the ability to architect a very solid deterministic system within the microcontroller so that uh, a timer event goes off, can trigger, automatically trigger a DMA transfer from an ADC into RAM, which will trigger another event, which will eventually give your calculator uh, calculations in your CPU 
uh, for career control algorithms, the ability to go off and calculate. And then once that's done, it can feed it back into the timers uh, well before the timers update events occur. And what you get there is a very tight, real-time deterministic control system uh, with very little CPU interaction. Uh, you can use that CPU just for calculations, but everything else is uh, the waveforms are generated automatically. The PWMs are generated automatically. The ADCs can read based off triggers from the timers. Uh, you can do the same thing for op amps and for comparators. So that linkage is what I uh, would say is critical for some of these uh, advanced real-time applications. This portion of our podcast is brought to you by ST Microelectronics. ST's technology is found everywhere microelectronics makes a positive contribution to people's lives, enabling smarter mobility, more efficient power and energy management, and the wide-scale deployment of the Internet of Things and 5G technology. ST helps customers make these devices more intelligent, more energy efficient, more connected, safer, and more secure. Further information can be found at www.st.com. Changing gears uh, a little bit here, do you find that the strong majority of the companies that you're working with have very proficient firmware engineers, or are they engineers who are very skilled in their particular application who kind of learn firmware as a second language, so to speak? I see a spectrum of customers with a variety of embedded skill sets, mm -hmm. customers that are building your electronic components with microcontrollers spitting out you know millions of units a year will have what I consider the professional embedded development team there. They'll be very fluent in C and C++ and all the tools needed to develop on a microcontroller. They'll have multiple firmware engineers on board, uh, very solid, tightly coupled validation, uh, non-regression testing uh, needed to birth your product. However, I would say that a majority of customers that we run into are what I consider, uh, uh, they have one to two, three firmware engineers uh, that do a lot of everything. They're tightly coupled with their hardware designs and they don't have the great resources as a tier one company, but they have um, enough behind them. they still know the C coding language very well. They know the tools very well. And of course, with iterative product development cycles, uh, they can take one design and move the next one and improve what they have. Mm. So again, those are, are using a lot of our tools. We find that a lot of those customers will use our examples and our, our firmware libraries to get off the ground and actually maybe use some of that um, as they move toward their production uh, to vet that out. Uh, and then uh, and that would be more the ma uh, the majority. So uh and then I'd say there's a slight minority where you have people that are more hardware and not very much savvy in coding at the embedded level with firmware. Now with those customers, they come into two classes, ones that are really new and they are trying to learn. And we try to, we supplement our material. We have a lot of training material that we've developed on video lately. We have the ST YouTube channel and you can find several uh, embedded training topics right now out on YouTube to help people get started out of the box. Mm -hmm. If they're a, uh, a major customer and they still are lacking the firmware background, typically what we do is we will go to consultants or third parties that have that background and bring them into the design, um, introduce them to the customer and make sure that they have what they need to get their firmware off the ground. Because it is a design cycle. It is a specific skill set. You need to take the time to know uh, what it is you're doing and all the techniques around that to, to make your product the best it can be. And so our, our, our network of consultants and third parties that can help customers get off the ground is very important as well. And we've seen several customers that actually have taken advantage of that to get their product out the door, especially for time to market. So that helps supplement uh, engineering teams that may not have that embedded firmware background. You know, you can spend your life specializing on uh, embedded programming in the firmware library, and a lot of these consultants mm. have done that. The third category where they say, well, we just, you know, we, uh, we definitely need uh, help, we'll say, or uh, we're not all that, uh, we don't have a lot of expertise um, in firmware. You had mentioned various resources that 
those types of engineers can uh, can take advantage of. What are some of those resources? So if you're a hardware designer and you want to learn microcontrollers, I would advise one, go to our ST YouTube channel, look for the STM32G0 MOOC to get started, buy a board, buy a USB cable, download the IDE software as instructed in the video, and that will get you started. And there are plenty of resources education-wise to teach you C, embedded C, um, to help you with debugging, to understand how things work. You have enough feedback from these training sessions to get going and start. It's a long road. Um, so the first step is to, to get it, get started, get out of the box, and then start your continuous education on the embedded programming side. You can go to uh, one of the distributors, DigiKey or Mauser, and pick up an STM32G0 uh, nucleo board or discovery kit. And I think they're less than, uh, you know, 10, they're about $10, $15 maybe max uh, to get started. You buy a USB cable. Uh, you can download the tool chain, which means you could download the, what we consider our Cube IDE uh, for free, install that, and start going through those videos, and they'll give you a very rudimentary basics how to get started. Uh, the beauty with the modern microcontroller today, uh, especially with the ARM Cortex devices, is uh, the ability to immediately download your code into Flash and run, and also debug basically on the fly. It's basically instant. Um, you may remember the mm -hmm. days when we used to have to program uh, double EEPROMs, and if we made a yeah. mistake, you had to go out there and reflash them with ultraviolet light. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yep, and they have these enormous uh, evaluation boards, too, that were just huge. <laughs> yeah, or the days of emulations for microcontrollers. You'd buy the emulator before you'd buy any silicon uh, so that you'd have some software there so that you can code everything up in an emulator. And once you're ready to go, then 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 you might buy the silicon and then uh, maybe one-time program it. <laughs> like that's, that. that's right. That was my era. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the tools we have today are just phenomenal. Um, if I look back in my education, and I, I graduated university in 1990, we didn't really have any in-chip debugging. Now we have mm -hmm. that. You could down your, download your flash, and in the same command, fire up your debugger, and you can single step through your code looking at almost any variable in memory space, which is a humongous advantage in, in getting started today. It's uh, it, especially when you look at the embedded level. And it's it, those types of tools uh, really facilitate getting people out of the box quickly. And uh, again, for those customers that may be struggling with embedded firmware, uh, you know, if you have a very valuable project don't hesitate to call a consultant. The, there's some fantastic people out there that can get stuff out the door very, very quickly for you. And they can also help train your workforce up uh, in the future. Uh, so there's a there's definitely that industry out there that can help folks get off the ground. Uh, there's lots of training consultants out there that can help take teams of two or three people and get them started with embedded programming and go through uh, major uh, initiatives such as security or safety or uh, design considerations, as we've talked about, is uh, when you go into a microcontroller, it is a system to start with. Uh, it's it's a microcontroller is a unique system in and of itself that you need to understand. And there are a lot of compo components that you uh, are going to want to learn about uh, to solidify your design. Um, so these consultants can definitely help get you on the right track, and use the features of the microcontroller to help produce a very high-quality design. I love it. I love it. Um, choose what you want to be an expert in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we, I still see what I consider this gap between analog engineers and digital. And, uh, and those people that are specialized in analog uh, uh, domains have tremendous knowledge of how things work. And then mm -hmm. the move into a secondary coding, uh, it could be somewhat painful. So I believe this gap is definitely uh, something that's going to be crossed. And uh, so it takes some time. And you've got to take the time, set out a goal of you know one to two years to learn as much as you can on the embedded space, start programming today, 
and just take it one day at a time. And then as you start learning the different techniques and the different coding practices, you'll be able to take your analog knowledge and bring it into the digital realm. Right, exactly. And like you said, it just complements your skill set. I, uh, you know, when I came out of uh, college, University of Miami, I was focusing on digital audio. And what I what I came away with was very, very strong understanding of DSP. Um, my languages of choice were assembly and C++. But I got a big reality check when I entered the industry. So um, you have to leverage what you're good at, obviously, but extending your, your skills and your capabilities does not have to be painful if you're choosing the right tools and the right resources to help get you started. That's correct. And uh, again, it's a learning curve on both sides. Uh, your digital audio uh, experience today is, is probably extremely valuable. If you look at how audio is shaped up, um, Digital microphones and signal processing, especially, is is uh, it's another area we didn't talk about. But audio, and again, with the processing capabilities we have in our modern day microcontrollers, uh, you you can do many of the audio audio filterings you need digitally. You don't need the extra circuitry to do that, and you have the ability once you put it in digital to create whatever effects you want for your audio to work. Absolutely. The uh, 32-bit performance, um, just operating at blazing fast speeds. I don't need to go find a highly specialized DSP and do things in assembly anymore. You know, I can I can actually control a circuit using the exact same controller that's that's running my audio processing al- algorithms. Yeah, I've, I've really watched that. Uh, I'm a slight audiophile myself. I've been working on audio projects since I started with STM32 and, oh, nice. and watched the birth of the ARM Cortex and... Uh, uh, slowly being able to benchmark our DSP capabilities with the ARM Cortex up to these traditional DSP processors. And uh, yeah. we're still continuing that roadmap today. Um, so it's it's been interesting to see how uh, we've shifted away from 8-bit to 16-bit. Um, now we're, we're looking at, okay, the high-end DSPs, 24-bit, um, uh, you know, are we going to be able to supplement uh, with standard cores uh, and the beauty of the microcontroller is that once you brought the general purpose microcontroller and you can do some of this DSP, you did not need that specialized device for all your high math. Yeah. Um, so you could put it in one device, have all your control in one device. And uh, if you have the performance and bandwidth to do that, uh, it, it really uh, simplified the designs. <laughs> Absolutely. Totally agree. Oh, man. Okay. So now we have two follow-up episodes that we need to uh, go record. <laughs> one will be I- IoT device security. The next will be uh, microcontrollers for high performance audio. <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. I'd be happy to bring some of my experts on as well to discuss some of the intimate details there. Do ah, let's do it. This would be great. Um, all right, cool. I'm now now I'm just being greedy, okay. but I uh, I really really do appreciate your time. This has been fabulous. All right, well, thank you very much, Dave. Yep, thanks, Sean. Bye. Huge thanks to our guests, Tim Sager and Sean Newton, who joined us from their home offices this week to lend their perspectives. And we want to hear from you. Are you pretty well versed in software development? Do you know just enough to be dangerous? Or is firmware not even on your radar at this point? Drop your thoughts into the comments section on allaboutcircuits.com. And if you enjoy Moore's Lobby, please leave us a review online and take a moment to subscribe. It's a small gesture that goes a long way in helping us to build a meaningful community of listeners and contributors. Thanks for listening.